recording. Sorry about that. So we're now recording. We got part way into to Tom Ellis's uh, presentation, and he's talking about gear. He's about to talk about setup. So one thing about mandolin setup is that the bridges are not fixed, and so over the, over the course of time of continually tuning a mandolin up to pitch, it would tend to pull the bridge forward and forward towards towards the nut, and it will shorten the action, make them play sharp. So you would want to look at your mandolin and make sure that the bridge, everything's backwards, I don't know why, but is vertical and not tipped forward towards the fingerboard. That's a common, common issue uh, with mandolins. And I also am, am a, a big proponent of people adjusting the height of the bridge up and down. Uh, a lot of people are scared to do that, but I think it's really a good idea to get to know your mandolin. And ideally, if you wanted to, to maintain the optimum playing action all the time, you probably would do that seasonally and you would raise the bridge in the winter because the wood dries out, the instrument shrinks and the action will get lower. In the summer, it's more humid in general. And so the instrument will swell up, pump up the top and the, and the action will be higher. So you would lower the bridge in the summer, raise the bridge in the winter. Most people don't do that. In fact, I don't usually do that either. But uh, that's one thing that, that I, I encourage people to do and to adjust the intonation, move the bridge back and forth to get it to play in tune up, up the neck. And I won't teach anyone how to intonate a bridge because it's a real, I'm, they have Google for that. Um, <clears throat> another thing is the nut, the, the bone nut here where the strings cross at the end of the fingerboard is very critical. It has, the strings have to be the right height off of the frets. The strings have to be the right distance apart from each other. The strings have to be the right distance away from the edge of the fingerboard. And all of that's really very specific. And I make my string spacing be the same on all my mandolins and it's the way I like it. But some people um, would, would go for a very different kind of a string spacing and it gives you a very different feel. Um, but a lot of times uh, we do repair work here sometimes, not very often, but when we get a different brand of mandolin in, uh, I mean, I've never seen one come in that did not need a new nut, uh, in my opinion. But a lot, most of the time, the, the customer is unaware of that. Uh, Tom, I was Tom, I was amazed the first time that I saw him play a Givens mandolin how how the string spacing that he did um, they were just right on top of each other, very little spacing. And it's like you say, the feel was remarkably different. Yeah, and also, and I believe that some of the given mandolins that I've seen had quite narrow necks, which if you don't have big hands, I, I, I like a narrow neck. They're actually faster to play than wide neck mandolins. But if you have pretty good sized hands, a wide neck mandolin is, is quite reasonable. Um, and uh, Tim's Nugget is a, is a great playing wide neck mantle and has, has a great feel to it. So <clears throat> now, the other thing I'll say about nut spacing because it's, it's so uh, I've been working on it lately is that Sam Bush plays with a very wide spacing between his strings and a wide neck, which is an entirely different kind of a feel. And uh, the, I don't quite, I don't quite go for it, but uh, he and I have been working together the last couple of years on a project. So uh, hopefully there'll be something to see there in the future. Uh, and at least some of those will have his wide spacing. So that's kind of interesting. And <clears throat> let's see. Hey, Tom. Yes. Uh, do you know it to be 
true that um, the reason that he uses that spacing is because that's the way Norman Blake had it spaced when he uh, sold it to him? Is that like a Norman Blake thing? You know, I never did ask him. Uh, good, I, good question. It will come up. We're fixing to send the prototype. I, think I heard that said. Weeks. So, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. It's been an interesting project and, and fun that uh, was supposed to have already come to fruition, but uh, been a <laughs> been a, been a few stumbling blocks the last. Uh, I thought last year was over last year, but I guess it was. It's, it wasn't quite over until. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was hoping the crap would end in twenty twenty. All right. Well, we're, we're all on the upswing now. Um, <clears throat> so uh, as far as the difference in, in tone between the old Gibson Lloyd Lore 1920s mandolins and mandolins today is that uh, really many of my customers don't, don't play strictly bluegrass music. In fact, I would say the vast majority of them don't. And kind of that fundamental punchy strident sound of the Lloyd Lore kind of tone. Uh, not exactly what a lot of players today are looking for, particularly people who just play in the living room with their family and friends. Uh, they, they want something, you know, with more sustain, more, more um, <clears throat> you know, more richness. And so it, it's, a, it's, it's a kind of a different market. And when I custom build mandolins, I do always ask the customer, you know, what, what kind of music do you play? Do you go out and do battle with banjos, fight off people like Larry, or do you, you know, do you uh, just, you know, sit in your living room and play by yourself? And I think it really, it's a different mandolin. And of course you can then use the selling point of, let's say, well, you need two mandolins. You need one for going out and then you need one for at home. Um, <clears throat> which is why I kind of want to build me a new one that's a twin point oval hall, uh, which would, I would never really recommend as someone's only mandolin, but since I already have three and, you know, I can have four. Um, so hopefully I will build myself one of those here soon. And I think I'm gonna kind of cut it short and so we don't get too much out of time here and uh, let it, cause I wanna hear what Billy has to say. <laughs> Just one, just one question. You mentioned the twin point oval hole. Isn't that what? Uh, is that what? Um, uh, <coughs> what Jethro was playing? And is, is yes. there a reason for that? Yep. And uh, <clears throat> I've really been happy with the ones we built. I've built about ten of them now. Well, I've, I've built about ten twin points, and only about the three of them are oval holes. Um, It's a, it's a really cool sound. Uh, not one that I would expect would take over. They actually do real good uh, keeping up with, with a few people. I, I still don't think it would be the instrument for a 10 person bluegrass jam, but I'm not sure I'm the person for a 10 person bluegrass jam, so. Any other questions for Tom? And looks like we had a few other people join us. I see Tim and Mike, and I think there was one other I saw join as well. Welcome, <laughs> welcome. We're uh, just stepping through. We are recording, so you know. Thank you, Tom, for that. Uh, if you've got any other questions for Tom, go ahead and you can ask him at this point, or you can uh, you can ask him at any point too, or pop him in the chat, and we'll get them to him. So with that, let's uh, let's move along to Billy. All right. Hey, this is cool. Like learning how to use this and seeing how many familiar faces are on here. So nice to see everybody. Um, been uh, super in super isolation out here. <laughs> um, I'm gonna. I, I I would really love to 
get my hands on one of those mandolins you were just talking about, Tom. <laughs> yeah. I like that. That's a good subject. The, uh, um, I mean, I, there's a ton of people on this list that I've given lessons to over the years, but um, uh, for those of you that I haven't met, um, I'm just a local Austin mandolin picker, came up through the Arts Rib House ranks and just started playing with whoever I could. And uh, then I've given a lot of mandolin lessons over the years. Um, and this last year has been very interesting in the sense that, uh, well, even giving lessons has, has taken on a whole new uh, direction. And I live in a place where I, um, I live out where bluegrass lives, which is not where the internet is good. Um, <laughs> but um so i haven't been very successful with uh or had much luck with doing live online lessons plus i find it's really frustrating when i can't like reach over and go no right there right there um and i think that uh the students find it frustrating too so i've spent a uh, a lot of this last year um before my priorities totally changed um i spent a lot of this last year sort of woodshedding how to come up with clear concise ways to teach mandolin and share mandolin information um by you know creating videos and stuff which of course led me all sorts of places i didn't want to be like you know being a youtube creator or, <laughs> or whatever um but there's been a lot of learning going on. But the cool thing as it relates to mandolin is that it's uh, really taken me back to the essence of teaching, which is the greatest thing for the teacher is to, you know, relearn what you already know, which is what makes it such a useful, useful thing. So um, anyway, uh, where was I going with that? Um, uh, I've been lately. I've gotten so far away from playing the mandolin that that uh, I've actually lost my calluses for the first time, and uh, that I can remember. And so I'm having to start a, a new and work on my technique um, and and. Uh, it's kind of cool to um, have to go through that process again and, and re rework and on, on stuff. And so that's, uh, that's my goal is to make some concise presentations of some of the stuff that I want to share, um, which <laughs> um, has eluded me at this point, but uh, I'm still working on it. Um, so for today, I was going to talk to you guys just about some, something that I've, discovered on the mandolin that I that I really enjoy that I'm not going to I'm not going to say I invented it but I don't I don't hear it happening very much um the uh it's a it's rhythm it's a rhythm part it's a rhythm thing and um it's definitely not like a a bluegrass thing but uh as I get into the fundamentals of all the technique for myself what I've been working on I realize that you know, just like building a house or something, which is uh, something else that I have going on in my life here in the background. Um, uh, just like all that, if you get it, you know, if you're off on the foundation, then everything, nothing's square. <laughs> nothing's square um, as you build up. But um, so as I've been working on my foundational stuff, I always come back to rhythm, 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 right hand. Um, and all of you who have ever taken lessons from me can attest to that. So here we go today, just some more of that same old preaching about the right hand. <laughs> so, Chip, I don't know. I've stopped hearing other people here for some reason, but um, you're doing you're doing fine. Maybe my. I hear you just fine. Your out. audio, your audio is good. Your video is a little bit long. Oh, okay. Audio, audio is fine. 
for me. I don't know if anybody else is having a problem. Okay. Good. Well, well, I'm going to keep it simple here and in, in short. Um, but uh, I um, I sent you uh, a screen picture that we can share to the group um, anytime if you like. Um, Should but be uh, Every, everybody that's see that screen. Kind of what I'm going to show you. So. Yep. It's up on the screen now. So this is, this is a, okay. Okay. I see it now. Cool. This is something I like to do on the, um, you know, a lot of those old Waylon Jennings and Willie Nelson recordings and all sorts of other stuff you, you listen to, they do this, um, cut time thing where it's like half the band is playing in uh uh four, four you know two feel like just a and then the other half of the band is playing in like cut time uh i think is what they call it so you know basically we have like the bluegrass feel for lack of a better word um which some people would call that two, four. Some people would call it four, four. I wrote it out as four, four, just because the pattern that I'm gonna show you is a four, four pattern, uh, not a two, four pattern. But like in four, four, you know, the chop would be on the two and four. The good old bluegrass chop, the sound that even if you went into like a Dixieland jazz band, and then if you started doing that, it would all of a sudden sound like bluegrass. Um, we got that, and then we have, you know, what I would refer to as like the Sam Bush chop, <laughs> or whatever, the, the, the sort of halftime rock and roll chop. So the first one would be where your chops are on two and four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And then with the same count, two, three, four, the second would be on just three. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. So um what I like to do, and I discovered this, um, it was kind of like a recording thing where I wanted to have one mandolin doing one thing and then one mandolin doing another. And then I liked it and wanted to be able to do it live. And so I just tried to figure out, figure out a way to do it. And this is what I came up with. Um, uh, And that's how it sounds in the end. Um, so, uh, that's it. That's it. I would put my metronome on one and three, and which I don't have with me at the moment, unfortunately. Well, I guess I could make this sound like a metronome. Hold on, I'll show it to you with a click. Uh, and this is one of those things that uh like one of those mid-tempo feel things works good on that um let's see here's the click i think come on oh it's not a touch screen <laughs> Yeah. 
There we go. Can y'all hear that click at all? Yes, we can. One, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. So here's your good old chop. Here's your halftime chop. Here we go, one, two, three, four. Yeah. Any questions? <laughs> Something to work on. How does that last rhythm, the one that, that, that you made, how does that sound in a bluegrass context? I, I'm having trouble picturing that up there. What, what does it do to the feel? Well, it wouldn't, I, yeah um it, it's it doesn't really it's not uh i wouldn't i wouldn't employ that in a bluegrass context i would employ that probably more in a uh singer songwriter or with a with a drummer even um or uh um like a lot of times when i play with drums they they either they want you to they don't want you to play where the snare is playing they want you to kind of uh figure out a different thing to, to, um, to, to add, like, to have your own space in the, in the, within the beat structure, rather than doubling up their snare part, because, you know, I mean, that's just, uh, more, just as likely that you'll be off with them as you might, as you will be, be, be right in, in with them, so, um, yeah, I wouldn't employ it in a bluegrass context, but in uh, some of, in a lot of my, in most of my uh, workings, they're not in the strict bluegrass. Uh, it's not even what I would call bluegrass. So, um, but I'm kind of a hard ass when it comes to bluegrass. So <laughs> forgive me. But um, yeah, I wouldn't employ it in a in a strict bluegrass scenario for sure. Other questions for Billy? Yeah, just wondering, uh, can you name a song that we might recognize that you would use that in? Well, I've used it in a couple of wooden wire recordings like uh, um, uh, Kingpin and uh, My Hometown are both based on that uh, rhythmic feel. Um, yeah, in fact, Kingpin is the one we were recording that I did the the multi-track mandolins and then kind of needed to figure out how to do it um, in real time. <laughs> All right, well, good. Well, thank you, Billy. I noticed, too, on your screen share, I liked your toes, too. Your toes showed up yeah. on that screen. <laughs> so, anyway... I don't have any toes in my picture. Any any last questions? Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Any other questions for Billy? Well. All right. Well, thank you so much. Good. Good deal. Let's see. I should be able thank to you. see if I see if I can figure it out. I, here. I have a question for Billy. This is Chuck. When, when is uh, Wooden Wire going to do its first live gig, or or, or have you been? <laughs> Uh, we have not been, and I don't, there's nothing, okay. we don't have anything on the books or planned or anything. Yeah. yeah I saw uh, you at Slim Fest so last night. I'll let you know if I know. Okay. 
Yeah, that was about our last, our second to last performance. Mm -hmm. Billy, I have you on the books for us in March. So it's a long way off. <laughs> oh, that's true. Oh. <laughs> well, that's true. We have, we have, yeah. It'll be a reunion gig. Eddie. Yeah. <laughs> we, got, we got anything uh, exactly. on the horizon? Well, uh, just a plug for Billy, you guys had an album come out during the pandemic. Wouldn't That's wired. true. That's true. Uh, we of... did. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that was that was a uh, good you know it was a good uh I, let's see how do i say this it was a uh, we had plenty of time to take care of all the things that need to be done to put out the album you know <laughs> so yeah it was good it was something to do yeah fair uh, good well it's good stuff well, to keep but thanks for mentioning that eddie yeah Let's see, Richard, you had a question for Eddie well, or something I was about what's going more on. The New World Deli Night. Is that anything coming up on the horizon with you, Eddie? Well, I'm I'm working with them. Uh, I will be back there on May 13th, but we'll be tiptoeing back towards should being able to do an open mic thing. As you can imagine, people grabbing and using different mics, and if you just remember the constant re reusing of equipment there was something we have we we'll have to think about so it won't won't happen the first time i'm back there but uh, definitely i've heard from a lot of people for those that aren't aware i did make a, a video celebrating the event and uh, had uh, many of you that played there you you showed up in the video so you were one of the stars there richard <laughs> Well, it's more about hanging out and visiting everybody. Yeah, so so, so the hanging out thing will will start again in May. We'll get some microphone rubbers. You know what I mean? Yeah. Slip them on and off as we go. All right. Well, let's. Uh, yeah, and we'll keep an eye on that too. We believe me, we struggle. CTBA and AFTM, both of whom I'm associated with, we struggle with how to advertise gatherings back together. Because uh, the venues are responsible for that, but um, you know, bottom line is keep keep your eye tuned, and and yes, it will occur again. So I'm going to move on to the next next session, and uh, again, it's getting a little bit late. It's 3:23. If you do feel like you need to drop off, there I did put in the early part of the chat, and and I'll probably send something out at the end. I've got the uh, a copy of what I'm going to go over. In, in the chat that you can open up and you can save it off so you can go through it if you need to drop off. But I'll go, I'll go ahead and step through it. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen because it's a lot more interesting than my toes. Let's see, wait a minute. There we go and let's see where did I put it? Oh, heck. I thought I opened it. Um, I'll go ahead and get started and open in a second. What I was gonna go over is the, is the, uh, the idea of mandolin harmonies, and that's been something that I have sure enjoyed doing during the pandemic, uh, playing with them and and uh, and actually kind of playing playing them, uh, you know, recording myself playing them and then coming back and and uh, and playing them playing them the harmony with myself. And, and I'm saying all this so I can go ahead and get this screen open that I'm trying to do simultaneously. And there, I think I finally have it. All right, is my screen probably not yet? Let's see, screen, stop, share, screen share. Here we go. Should be right there. There we go. Y'all see that? Yep. All right, perfect. Let me get down here to mine. So, so you know, bottom line, approaching mandolin harmonies, these are things that I do. You know, the first thing is I find it easier, easiest than D or G. A is not bad either, but pick a key that you're going to pick a tune that's in a key that's fairly easy. D and G obviously are fairly easy because some of the tonics are, are right there in open strings. 
you know, the other thing that is essential to me to learning the, the fretboard and, and learning to play harmony is to be able to go through and, and do your arpeggios. Um, you know, so, you know, so like a D arpeggio, you know, very simple arpeggio, or you can go up two scales. You know, but get those arpeggios because those notes are going to be those notes are going to be essential to it, and get them both directions. And then if you get really really uh, wide open, you know, do the one four five arpeggios. And I didn't put those. There's a bunch of these out there, but um, you know, in G for example, let's go with A for example. There's a bunch of them out there that do do those kinds of 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 uh, you know the one one the uh, one four five chords do the arpeggios for those, and then if you get really really tricky, you can the arpeggios the exercises that I like to do are the uh, the the chord scales you know so something like whoops. something where you're really exploring the fingerboard and those are just arpeggios and you know I'm of the mind that if you work on arpeggios then you're paying the dues to do harmonies or almost any anything so, and these are some arpeggios that are in there these are fairly common I wrote these out these are fairly common these are closed position arpeggios one four five arpeggios in each of the major keys so um, Take some time and work on these. They're not boring. They're very meditative. Let's see. Um, all right, so so there's some things to work on. Uh, I wanted to go through chinkapin hunting. If you were in, a, I did a workshop last year, year before, whenever the last AFTM on chinkapin hunting. Um, this is the D version, and the you know I first heard this from Carol Best, uh, who who was a banjo player in Western North Carolina. Um, plays a little bit differently, and then I did discover Baron Collins Hill, who's, who runs uh, MandoLessons.com, has a version on there. Pretty pretty similar, but uh, it's a great one to do harmonies on. It, it really is. So so I don't read music all that well, but um, hopefully I've made minimal errors here on this. But the, you know, what I did on this is you've got the melody line. And you've got the harmony line, you know, and this is one approach to playing the harmony. Um, you know, so I think, let's see, and so a couple ideas. You got to learn the melody first and, and uh, play the melody. Goodness gracious, what a surprise. Play the melody, learn the melody, and stick to the melody um, at least once or twice through. Show people that you really do know the tune before you get off and, and do too much too much outside the melody. You know, add your own style. When you when you do chinkapin hunting here, for example, you know, to me, style in mandolin comes from not playing the notes them necessarily. It's the it's you know, like Hartford and J.D. Crow said, it's the timing between the notes, but it's also what you do to get to that note. Um, to me, part of my style, let's see, when I, um, if you could mute, your, uh, I hear a mandolin kind of capturing my, my ear. If, you, if you're playing, go ahead and mute yourself. But your style, your style comes, in my mind, from the slurs, hammer-ons, and pull-offs. So when you do, let me switch cameras here real quick, see if this works. Turn this off and let me switch to this camera. All right, let's see. I'm seeing Richard for some reason. Why am I seeing Richard? Uh, all right, you get, looks like looks like we've got it there. So when you do chinkapin hunting, I can do it this way. can play every single note with my right hand. It sounds pretty boring in my ears, so one way to get your own style here 
only use downstrokes except where absolutely essential. And I can play the A part of chinkapin hunting one time through with only two downstrokes. I'm sorry, two upstrokes. It's all downstrokes. And it sounds different. Whoops, that sounds awful. You know, so it, it, it may not sound right there, but you're getting, you're, you're using slides, hammer-ons, and pull-offs, and those will add to your style as opposed to a whole pile of eighth notes backed up, pounded against each other. So that's a thought there. And whoops, 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 not that. I'm gonna get back over here, right there, share. So do that, um, and then you can record yourself playing, playing, uh, playing the melody and play harmony with yourself, play it back and play harmony, or uh, this particular site, let me see if I can make this work, give me just a second, should have done this beforehand, but I think I can do it pretty quick, that recording, I've actually recorded myself doing it uh, once, uh, tw twice with the melody and twice with the uh, with the uh, harmony so I'm gonna go ahead and play it it's only about three minutes here and you can get a feel for how it sounds if I can play it yeah, there we go. let me start that over and turn it down just a little bit here we go I think switch cameras back here there we go that's better and so you know that's a good way to get through it learn the melody add some of your own style to that melody um, one thing on the melody real quick let me back up so the way that I've written it is more like If you listen to Carol Best play it, he actually plays it a little bit differently, and I don't call it a different version, but he's his version is more like. Which is interesting. And uh, if you're not familiar with Carol Best, as far as I'm concerned, he's the one who invented the melodic banjo. Uh, he did it in an old time con in an old time context. Let's see. Um, 
and and I think that's pretty much what I wanted to touch on. Um, so let me stop. Let me stop there and see if there's any questions. Let me turn this off. Questions or thoughts? Is this Tim Wilson here? Can you hear me? Yes, Tim. Go ahead. Welcome. I was just going to say that when it comes to working out harmony parts, there's a program called Amazing Slowdowner, which is about 15 bucks. And you can slow down something you recorded of, your, of yourself and slow it down and it stays in pitch. It's a pre pretty cool thing. So if you're working on a harmony, that'd be, you could just do slow it down as much as you, ooh, sorry about the cat, uh, slow it down as much as you want. And the other thing about style, I think it's a quote from John Hartford. He said something like, uh, style begins where talent leaves off. <laughs> I always thought that was pretty funny. And that's, that's all my comments. That Thank sounds you. about right. That sounds about right, Tim. That's good very cool. very good. Hey, yeah, Chip. It's a good comment on the uh, amazing slowdowner. I do use that too. One of the beauties of amazing slowdowner too, if you do subscribe to Spotify, you can actually import Spotify files directly into Amazing Slowdowner and slow down Bill Monroe from his 135 beats per minute on Rawhide down to a manageable, maybe 120 or something like that. Somebody else had a question. Yeah, I did, Chip. So it's a it's a deep dive subject, but getting back to slurs and pull offs, you're talking about playing that song. You can play it all in down, basically down strokes, with the exception of a couple of notes here and there. But I think the problem for some of us who still work from rote, I mean, a lot of the fiddle tunes I know, I just know them well, muscle memory, just playing them through. But the trick is on the fly, if you will to stop that rapid interruption of 16th notes and figure out how to throw in the slide or the pull off because it really can mess up your timing. You know, mm -hmm. the point being is that I'm not sure that's something I could do on the fly. Maybe one needs to simply sit down and play with it for a long period of time. Any thoughts? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. I, um, you know, I, I, uh, I got to play once with uh, a song or two with Kenny Smith. It was during a guitar workshop, and and afterwards we got to play. It's one of my one of my favorite moments is playing Studebaker with Kenny Smith. But but uh, his his he's got he and I think Brad Davis and a couple others too. You know the old down up down up isn't as uh, they don't adhere quite as much to the down up down up approach. Well, I I. I'm not smart enough or talented enough to deviate very far from down, up, down, up. So, you know, one exercise that I did fairly early on to get to get accustomed to uh, slurs and hammer-ons or slides, pretty much slurs. Let me see if I can change my screen again here. Whoops. That didn't work. Let's hit this one. See if you can see this. Um, uh, you know, is to do like... You know, I can do a scale, a G scale, or I could do it with slurs and hammer-ons. So, so let's try that with an, a, an ascending scale with minimal strokes on each string. I mean, it's just an approach. You can do the same thing descending. Do pull-offs. You, you have to you have to violate it a little bit here to get the string on ascending, but it's you know just to start to get a feel, and then you can actually do that with you can actually start to incorporate some slides into that as well. And if you do those exercises, then then it does become perhaps a little bit easier to incorporate that on the fly. That's just a thought. Billy, anybody, anybody else who teaches, any thoughts on that? Well, one other comment. My, my friend uh, um, Tom Cook, who's a mandolin player up here in, uh, in Pennsylvania, um, s said that he, uh, he, he found that uh, upstrokes were his weakest part, point, and so he would try to play tunes entirely using the upstroke. So in, in addition to doing the uh, slurs and pull-offs and hammer-ons on the downstroke, you could try playing the same thing with just doing upstrokes. You, 
you were muted there. I went backwards. Yes. No, that's a great point, Larry. Absolutely. They, they can be done either way. And, you know, the other thing about, about to me, especially about slides and hammer-ons and getting some of your own style, you know, one of the things, you know, this is just a feeling of mine. There's, there's never been an instrument created that's as beautiful as the human voice when it comes to making music. And, and the closer that I can approximate the sound of the human voice on the mandolin, it makes it more appealing. I can never completely approximate it because I got these funny little things called frets in the way and I can't get those partial notes in between, you know, the, the eight notes or 12 notes, however many there are scale. But what I can do is use slides. So, you know, if, if I do, uh, there's a well being packed on, and I can do that or, and I can play it. Or I can make it sound more human. I can go. And I can get the slides in there to make it sound more human. And, and it, it, it is more appealing when it sounds that way. Good question. Those, those are just some tips. All right. Well, what else? Any? That's that's pretty much what I wanted to hit, and I I know I hit it pretty quick. We hit them all pretty quick. The check in at the beginning took a little time. We won't do that each time. But uh, um, any any other thoughts or or uh, interjections people want to want to share? Chip, uh, it'd be good if folks who would like to present something in the future would let us know in the next. Uh, I, I assume we're we're talking about doing this every couple of months, right? Yeah, great, great point, great point, Thomas. I, you know, I'm I mean I'm willing to do it quite frequently. Uh, uh, I, I'm certainly no more than once a month, but I think it would be if we have people like you say anybody can present. That was one of the beauties of the banjo forum. You had you had uh, people who right. played in bands all the way up to Alan Monday presented. And and, uh, and but anybody can present a topic. So if you have a topic, please feel free. Whether it's gear, instruction, technical, <clears throat> that'd be great. All right. Well, good deal. We did pretty well. Three forty-two. I was targeting an hour and a half, and we went a little bit over, but not too bad. Hey, Chip. Can I interrupt you one more time? Absolutely. Uh, Justin just asked, he typed in in the chat, how he got how to get on the mail list. Yeah. So he'd gotten the invitation from somebody else. Yes. Yeah, so let me do this. I'm going to type my email at gmail.com. There's my email. And any, anybody who, as far as I'm concerned, anybody who wants to join can join this. I'll just add you to the mailing list and, and be sure to look in your uh, promotions uh, portion of your mail but uh, and and feel free to share it except just not on social media somewhere good point yeah anything else Thomas or Billy well do you want to if you want to do it once I'm it doesn't matter to me if we want to try to do it once a month that I'm game for that too okay well this is Chuck I, I have a couple of words to say about it um, I was talking to Alan Mundy about three or four years ago and he gave me the idea to do the banjo forum so I ran with it, and basically I just am the organizer of it. But our first seven meetings were at people's houses around town. And I have to say that touch and feely stuff is really a lot of fun. It <laughs> limits the audience, the people that can come to it, of course. And Zoom wide opens that audience to the entire world. So there's a pluses and minus of each. And, of course, during COVID, we couldn't do it. So we've done the last two uh, on Zoom like this, and they've worked real well, too. But it's a lot of fun to, you know, get the touchy feely with everybody bringing their favorite instruments and playing in the different rooms of the house and things like that. And sometimes outside. Chuck, if you do, Chuck, if you do it on Zoom, uh, can uh, can I get uh, invite and then an invite too? Yeah, just send, just send me your email, Larry. Okay, yeah. I'll put I'll put it in the chat to you. Okay, sure. <clears throat> All right. Good deal. Thomas, anything else? 
thank you, Chuck, for that. That's a good point. I sure enjoyed the banjo form. I, you know, the nice thing about Zoom on the banjo form is you don't have to hear all the tuning and stuff. <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> well, you just accept that everything's out of tune? <laughs> yeah, something like that. But no, Chuck's point is a good one. I, you know, absolutely, you know, like I said at the very, very beginning, I'm not, not sure all of y'all were on. You know, my goal is not to keep these solely on Zoom. Absolutely, the goal is to, you know, and we'll follow the, the Austin City guidance. Uh, level three right now would prevent us from having anything greater than 10 people, and I think that has to be vaccinated people. So we're, we're going to be careful going into it. But the goal is certainly to be able to do face and face. But I will miss the ability to mute anybody. So other than, <laughs> other than that. All right, folks. Y'all take care. I'll follow up. And y'all take care. Thanks. Enjoy it. Yep. Do it again. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Chip. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot, everybody.